So we are tracking the origins of pedagogy, of how we evolved to become teachable and what the underlying structures are that enable us to learn and teach in ways which are really different to any other animal on our planet. And to do this, we're flying in through southern Africa to border cave that has some of the oldest and most extensive evidence of human behavior on Earth. And to get there, we're tracking the Lubombo Mountains with the Pongola River running through. And you've got Eswatini or Swaziland on your left. And then you've got the beautiful Makatini Flats on your right with the Lubombo Mountains running all the way through. And right there, almost on the ridge, you've got the border cave overlooking Eswatini, 40 meters long. Evidence of people having lived there for 200,000 years. Check out all the stuff you found. Digging sticks, beautiful ostrich jewelry shells and seashells, bone points which were used for uh, arrows, you've got awling tools used to stitch leather, you've got euphorbia mixed with beeswax to make sure you can bind things together, and then we have those beautifully worked bush pig tusks. But then check out those baboon fibulas, the calf bone. It's called the Lubombo bone because they found incised markings, 29 on the one, done at different times, some form of counting, we're not sure, from 44,000 years ago. So clearly by this stage, we as human beings had learned to collaborate with each other in all sorts of ways. But don't imagine that it was easy. I'm sweeping up Africa so we can take a look at our human ancestors. Three, four million years ago, there's Lucy for you in that whole far depression region in Ethiopia. And it's in those three million years that we evolved to become teachable. We evolved the capacity to learn. We needed it badly as well because our tools and our culture was becoming too complex to just pick up from scratch every time. It had to be passed from generation to generation. Learning became core to us as a human species surviving. And one of the best places we have first evidence of that is the border cave. And we really have to thank Lynn Wadley and the excavation team from Wits University for all the astonishing work and research they've done on this and a lot of the footage which I'm using at the moment, like this video you see now, is one of the students, Kayla McConaughey, actually posted this on YouTube and I'll give the link where you can actually see the whole video. And I want you to imagine people living here, men and boys going out hunting bringing back bush pig, warthog, zebra, parts of buffalo, uh, the woman going out and finding tubers and then cooking them inside the cave. So a healthy balanced diet, nice grass bedding layered across the cave for people to sleep comfortably. And as the sun sets at Border Cave, I want to give three examples of early forms of learning. Now the first one, you can see that lump of beeswax mixed with euphorbia. Now euphorbia can be used as a binding agent with beeswax to join uh, the shaft of an arrow to the arrowhead or it can be used as poison. It's actually a really nasty poison. I got poked by euphorbia once and I had to go on to antibiotics. It was so bad. And it can also be used as a medicine. Now the question becomes how did they know what the difference was between those three uses? Now, someone or some group would have had to have experimented at one stage and been innovative or through chance found out these different ways that euphorbia works. But then it gets transferred from generation to generation. And it's not like some expert person standing up in the cave and explaining the different benefits of euphorbia in different situations. It's more like a youngster or a novice watching someone work with the euphorbia in different contexts. So in one context, the person takes the euphorbia, mixes it with the beeswax and uses it to haft the shaft of an arrow onto the arrowhead. And then in another context, suddenly uses the very same thing, euphorbia, and then sticks it on the arrow tip rather than using it as a mixture. Now it's in that fundamental social activity that we have the origins of pedagogy. To try and make it explicit, here's a diagram.
Now here we can see two people who both have the joint goal of making an arrow. You've got a person in role X, he knows how to make the arrow properly, and then you've got a person in role Y, who doesn't know how to make the arrow properly, but is watching so he can work out how it works. Now in order for that to happen, they both have to pay attention to the same task. So there's joint attention on the task, and even though there's two different perspectives on the task, we have a capacity in us as human beings that once we've watched someone else do something, we are then able to imitate the action. Not because we're just imitating the steps, but because we actually understood what the goal of the actual thing was that was being done. And that's what gives us the central thrust of how pedagogy actually started to form. But it's one of the things we as humans do, and no other animal actually does it to the same level or extent. I want to give a second example, and this is taken from inside the cave. Lynn Wadley and her team from Vitz found evidence of grass bedding going back 200,000 years. And at least from 100,000 years ago, really good evidence that the bedding was systematically burnt at certain stages to clean the site and then what would happen is the ash would be spread and new grass would be put on top until eventually that was also burnt. Now imagine being a kid in the cave and then suddenly seeing your parents and the community suddenly starting to use this dangerous thing called fire and burn the very place that you're living within. There would have to be a situation where at that point the child and the parents both understood that there was a common goal. And the common goal was to clean the site and keep it free of the various insect and vermin that were around and to make it a comfortable and healthy place to live. The child then imitates the practice and so the practice carries over across generations and generations with new additions coming in. So for example, at a certain point, we find the mixture of camphor tree leaves within the bedding. And we know again that that smells really nice and also works as a kind of a protection against various insects. So hundreds of thousands of years ago in Southern Africa, with strong evidence at Border Cave, we can see shared goals starting up, where there was coordination of plans and intentions, where each participant actually understood what the other person was thinking and doing, and they could even eventually start to reverse the roles to help the other person with the role if needed. And it's there in the heart of those shared goals and mutual intentionality, shared intentionality, that we have the beginnings and the origins of pedagogy.